science enthusiasts, my name is Jason Zakowski. I'm a high school chemistry teacher and science communicator, but I'm also the dog dad of Bunsen and Beaker, the science dogs on social media. If you love science and you love pets, you've come to the right place. So put on your safety glasses, do up your lab coat, hold on to your tail. <laughs> it's time for the science podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Science Podcast. We hope you're happy and healthy out there. I'm recording this intro right after Beaker had a lesson of agility today, and Chris and I are just so proud of her. She's come so far. Um, Her Beakering Beakerness (laughs) is still there. She's still a little distractible, but her ability for recall and for reset and doing all the little agility tricks sure have come a long way. We posted some adorable videos to social media of her doing something she really struggled with initially, and now she's a rock star at it, which is the plank. She can do the weave, she can jump the little jumps, and she can go through the tunnel. But for whatever reason, walking on that plank really freaked her out. But she's she's great now. Our family also got to do this fun cosplay event and not really science podcast related, but it's family related. And uh, it's an event that a group in Edmonton invited us to. They're a great group of cosplayers that they gather to do community events, maybe go visit kids in hospitals. And we were, quote unquote, the entertainment for Superhero Night at the Edmonton Oil Kings. It was really fun to suit up as Groot and uh, meet all the kids. I think Adam might talk about his time as Loki later on in the podcast in the family section. What's on the science podcast this week? In science news, a new study looked at alcohol consumption versus how it affects your brain. And the results are actually quite amazing slash shocking. We'll get into it. Speaking of agility in pet science, we're going to look at agility dogs and injuries and how they could be avoided. And in Ask an Expert, we have a crime scene investigator who's going to be talking to us about her work with crime and forensics. Now, I'm going to warn everybody, um, this is a bit of a trigger warning. She gets into some discussions about death and murder uh, so some of you might find that fascinating from a science angle because we, we we need scientists like that to reconstruct crime scenes and figure out what happened to people. I do want to warn everybody who may be listening with young children uh, because we are going to be talking together about death and murder and, and human body injury because that's what her job is about some of the time. Hey dogs, do you know what happened to the criminal that stole a bunch of calendars? Well, he got 12 months. <laughs> okay, that's terrible. Uh, that's almost illegal. <laughs> okay, on with the show, because there's no time like science time. This week in science news, well, it's all about alcohol consumption. This caught my eye. I am not, I do not drink alcohol. Um, I cannot weigh in on if alcohol really tastes great. I just didn't get the bug to ever really drink it, ever, you know, even when I was a teenager. Um, I don't think I've had an alcohol drink in 20 years. <laughs> people think I'm weird, but I do know people like alcohol. I know Chris likes a glass of wine occasionally. So what does this study talk about with alcohol? The long and short of it is that even a small amount of alcohol, even a single glass of alcohol, one alcohol drink does have an effect on the brain. And One of the issues the study was looking at is we all know that chronic use of alcohol, especially excessive use of alcohol, is associated with a whole bunch of very, very direct and indirect adverse effects. But what about one or two drinks? What about is the effect of alcohol on one specific system, the brain? So one of the things they looked at in the study that was missing from a lot of previous studies was large data sets. Previous studies looked at a small amount of folks who maybe had chronic alcohol use or a small group of people who enjoyed one alcoholic drink a week. This, this study, the study is set apart by the, the just huge data set size. Using UK Biobank, the data set had over half a million British middle-aged and older adults. And the biomedical data was allowed them to parse out people based on height, weight, if they smoked. There's a whole bunch of extra information that they could then categorize with this huge data set. Then from this data set, they specifically looked at brain scans 
of around 36,000 adults in the biobank. And then they use that data with alcohol consumption to calculate two key variables, white and gray matter volume in different regions of the brain. Now to link the data set in this biobank to alcohol consumption, the volunteers answered survey questions about what kind of alcohol consumption levels they had. From completely not drinking alcohol at all, like me, to an average of four or more drinks a day. One of the things that they found when they crunched the numbers, and the study goes into huge detail of these like elaborate scatter plots. I was just marveling at their their graphing ability. Um, a pattern emerged, and it may be kind of shocking, actually. Even when they parsed out folks who were older or people who smoked, or different sexes. The pattern emerged was that gray and white matter volume that might be predicted based on what you would normally expect in a, in a person of that age or of that age with that other factor was reduced. So based on what the average person of that age would have for white and gray matter in their brain. And uh, there was distinct data sets, not from going from zero to one alcoholic drinks, but going from one to two or two to three, there were definite decreases in white and gray matter. And one of the things they mentioned is, well, it's not um, exponential. It's not linear. It's not like if you have two drinks, it's just a little bit worse. If you have three drinks, it's just a little bit worse. If you think like a linear relationship, it gets worse the more f- folks drink in a day. The, the more you drink, the greater effect it had on the volume of the brain. So another conclusion is that from this shrinking of the brain, they said it's similar to an, the aging of the brain. And the difference was pretty stark when you compared somebody who did not drink to somebody who was a heavy drinker. Zero to four drinks was the difference in 10 years of brain age. Now, the headline that the news used was one drink a day could be harmful to your brain. And I don't know if we want to go that far. I looked into the data and the big jump was from zero to two, like zero to one. There was a very small relationship between a uh, volume of brain and, and having that one drink a day. But the, the biggest data, the big jump was from zero to two. Zero to three, huge. Zero to four, even more. So perhaps we can leave the sensational clickbaity title out. I know maybe I said that at the start of the podcast. Data like this gives us things to think about. You can read a study that says one glass of red wine a day is great for your blah. That's what this one study could say. I know I've read those before. I know you've probably heard that before. This is a study that links drinking to the age of the brain based on its volume. Perhaps the saying, everything in moderation, isn't so great for alcohol if we use the study's findings and apply it to that saying. That's science news for this week. This week in pet science, let's talk agility dogs and injury. As I mentioned at the start of the podcast, and we've been talking for a while, we put Beaker into agility training. And it starts off really, really gentle, like jump over the lowest, the lowest bar you can, go through a little short tunnel. And it's great because dogs, when they're young, they don't understand the cues. There's a lot of hand cues. There's a lot of start line practice. Look at me. I'm starting to sound like an agility dog person. Anyways, I love it. I love working with Beaker. Her mind is like a little computer. And once she figures out what we want her to do, she wants to do it. She wants to please us so bad. (laughs) She's such a good dog. She does it. She just does so good at agility and she's so fast. So we're making use of all of her brattiness about how she how she's so bratty to Bunsen, and we're applying that to an agility course instead. So Bunsen gets a little bit of a break. I wonder how Bunsen would do an agility. He likes to listen and he likes to do things. I don't know. I don't know how he do on the tungle. <laughs> Anyways, I caught this. Uh, the study caught my eye about agility dogs and some of the things you can do if your dog is in agility uh, training to keep them from getting injured. And there's a couple of things that occur in agility dogs that are at a higher rate than other dogs. One is knee injury and the other is abdominal injury. So among agility dogs, the one that, the one injury we're going to look at is something called a cranial cruciate ligament rupture. 
It's kind of equivalent to an ACL tear in humans. The study was a research-based survey which asked pet owners what kind of exercise their dog was doing and linked it to that injury. And they found among the 1,200 agility dogs that uh, had their humans answer the survey, (laughs) um, there were some exercises that lowered the risk of this quote-unquote ACL tear, this doggo ACL tear, And there were some exercises that increased the risk. The exercises that seemed to help the most with reducing this injury was anything to do with core strength. So things like balance boards, wobble boards, um, pause up on a stool, anything that engaged the core of a dog. And that's like their giant abdominal area, but also some of the muscles in their front and back legs they wouldn't necessarily get from standing in a single place. I'll tell you, I I have uh, been going to a gym with a trainer, and that's one of the things I found that uh, it's not like I'm super fit guy because I'm not. But I did lift weights and I did run on the treadmill. But one of the things I neglected was my abs. I just I guess I hated doing sit ups. I don't didn't know sit up exercises. And the, the, my trainer, boy, do they have me working on my abs. Like every workout, there's some kind of ab thing. And one of the things I've noticed is because of that, for myself personally, I haven't had any back injuries. I was plagued with back injuries for about a, for as long as I can remember, even back in high school. And I haven't had a back injury since I've started focusing on my core. I guess that applies to dogs too. Now, aside from core strength, some other exercises that dogs did that decreased the risk of the tear, dock diving, scent work, and other engaging running and jumping. The dogs that engaged in agility courses and agility work more often weren't protected from getting that injury. In fact, the chance of that injury was a lot higher. Other things they found um, that might be interesting for those of you who have a female dog is if you spayed a dog before its first first birthday, they found that those dogs, um, if they were in agility at that young age, were way more likely to have their um, that quote unquote ACL tear. Maybe you need to wait or wait to get them spayed. A, a beaker is older than one now, she's so that's one of the reasons why we didn't really put her in any of that like really intense stuff. Is we were suggested by our vet to wait until she was more than one before we got her into anything that was more intense than just general obedience class. This study has a good data set. It has some good ideas to think about. And if you do have your dog in agility or not even if they're in agility, think of those core strength things. We put up, we put a video of Beaker doing paws up, which is just getting the dog to put their paws up on a stool and then have them rotate around the stool. That's a lot of work for a dog. It's a safe way to get them up. It's not like they're up on top of a counter. They're slightly elevated and they're working on engaging their abdominal muscles and moving around in a circle with their hips. It could protect their knees from those injuries. That's Pet Science for this week. Hey everybody, before we get to the interview section, I thought I would just give you some ideas about how you could support the Science Podcast. Number one, you could support us on Patreon. Check out patreon.com backslash Bunsen Burner. There's multiple tiers of support, and the lowest tier of support is not much more than a cup of coffee a month. The second way is you could check out our merch shop. We've worked really hard to partner with clothing companies that do a great job of providing vibrant colors and soft feels. We also have the Beaker Stuffy for sale. It's so cute. The third way you could support us is giving us great reviews on our podcast playing apps. Any kind of review helps. And if you can't find a review, share our podcast with people. Thanks, everybody. Now back to the interviews. It's time for Ask an Expert on the Science Podcast. And I have Leela Periello, who's a criminalist with me today. How are you doing today, Leela? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm good. Where are you calling into the podcast from? Where are you in the world? I'm calling in from Southern California. Uh, I live in Yucaipa, and I, I work in San Bernardino County. San Bernardino. Wow. Okay. So your weather is a little bit different than our weather up yes. here in Alberta. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. You're close. You're, are you on the beach, close to the beach? We're about an hour and a half, two hour drive. Okay. So, so you're not like the- on, on, on the, on the beach, but like, no. it's, it's not a bad trip to get there. Correct. Right. Mm, jealous. Very jealous. <laughs> I introduced you as a criminalist and we've never had somebody 
in your area of science before on the show. So I'm really excited to chat with you. But what what is the education to be a criminalist? Like you can't just wake up in the morning and say, I'm a criminalist, right? What's <laughs> what's no, your education to be a criminalist? Well, um, for my education, I got a, um, a, a bachelor's in science in psychology. So I was pre-med in undergrad. And then I got a, uh, my, I obtained my master's in forensic science um, in Scotland uh, over in Glasgow. And mm-hmm. then there are a bunch of other classes that I, are needed, uh, especially for DNA analysis. And mm-hmm. those were genetics, um, it's microbiology. You're, you do have a legit training in forensic science when what was the what was the decision to go into something like this um did you watch like was csi on tv and you're like that's what i want to do or was this way before those tv shows uh originally it was actually silence of the lambs with the forensic psychologist okay but then i kind of realized that um yeah those people don't really appreciate the fact that you put them in jail so oh. they could. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so then I, I found out that there was forensic pathology, and I really wanted to do that. So that was that was why I was pre med, and then I went to work in a pathology department, where I realized that staring at microscopes all day wasn't really what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So I found out that you could get a higher degree in forensics, and that's what I went to do. So I first started out in. Um, uh, as a, a deputy coroner investigator, and then I transferred into criminalistics in DNA. Did you say that you got your the, the thing that set you on the path was the Silence of the Lambs? Yes, I really. Liked- oh my goodness! What a what a wild origin story for yourself. <laughs> I really like Clarice and her forensic psychiatry. Wow! So, oh, that, that movie. Good. The Anthony Hopkins just gives me the willies every oh, time. Chills, the father yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's only in the movie for like 15 minutes too. It's mostly Clarice's story. Yes. Um, yeah. Jodie Foster did such a good job. So I can see why. The, I mean, that was a powerful movie. And if that's something you wanted to do, I, that's that's down the path. You you worked as a coroner? Well, I worked for the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. And okay. I was a deputy coroner investigator. A, dep- a deputy coroner investigator. Okay. What what is that? I I don't know. <laughs> uh, we're the the people that actually go out to scenes. We're the eyes and the ears for our forensic pathologists or the medical examiners, and okay. we go out uh, investigate uh, the scenes of the crimes or the death. Um, we try to identify our decedent. Um, try to help determine the mode of death, whether it's natural suicide, homicide, uh, accident, or uh, unknown tra- or traffic. And then we also take care of their their property. And we also notify uh, the family members. What a tough job. This is not this is not a job the average person can do just by you listing all of that stuff off. Um, I would nope out of that the first day. I'd be like, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. It's yeah, it's a definitely um, some specific types of people go into that line of work. So, With your time going to crime scenes, were you kind of thrown out there the first couple of times and you had to deal with what you saw? Is there any training in that? Like I would just be, oof, uh, could you, could you fill us in on that? They kind of, they don't really throw us out. I mean, I'm speaking specifically for our training program. Um mm-hmm. So you do, there is a training program. It's about six weeks long and, um, you'll, they'll teach you the laws that you need to uphold in the state Mm -hmm. of California. Um, also go over for, there are two types of people that, uh, generally work in our division, um, would be people with law enforcement backgrounds or people with medical backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So I had the medical, the science background, and I, I got a little more, training in the law enforcement side. Okay. And so then you, you're trained on the laws. Um, you do some time back in the morgue with the, with the doctors to learn how they like things described, what you're seeing, um, in a nice controlled environment. Um, but then you'll also go out with the other uh, deputy coroner investigators Mm -hmm. to see how to 
deal with scene security, um, interacting with other law enforcement agencies, mm-hmm. making notifications to family and things like that. You're, you're taken out with your trainer to go. Do okay. That. Right. Yeah. So you, you got, um, you're like an intern for a while before you're on your own. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. Now I have a couple more follow-up questions and this might, um, get into some ground that maybe make people uncomfortable, but your job is that job is super important when people die, right? When there is a, a death. Yes. Well, it's a grisly puzzle or a sad puzzle. That puzzle is what potentially can help out law enforcement, but then also families too. Correct. Um, is there any case in the past that you can talk to us about without going into too many details that you felt you your job solved a really difficult puzzle? Um, some of the ones that actually come to mind were, there was one where we found some skeletal remains out in the desert, mm-hmm. uh, since it's Southern California. And based on um, his dental records and uh, items that he had on the scene with him, we were able to figure out who he was but then the part that I really enjoyed with that case was tracking down family that was in another country and letting them know what happened to their loved one. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Oof. They probably were relieved to get the call, at, at least at some level, um, sad, but relieved to know. Right. As long as mm. at least they know now what happened to them because he'd been missing for a little while. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. You know, I have so many questions. <laughs> I have so many questions that are just like, I'm, I'm a curious person and I don't want to offend people that are listening, but I would imagine when you go to crime scenes, there are uh, like scenes and smells that do you ever get used to some of that, especially if there was a body there for a while? Yeah, you can. I mean, it's still horrible when you walk in, but mm-hmm. um, the key actually is to not leave and come back. So that your your nose kind of becomes nose blind. Oh, I see. I but, see. Yeah, it's it's something you sort of get used to after all this mm-hmm. time. But wow, still disgusting. <laughs> yeah, still pretty gross. When you were on scene, you were taking notes, uh, like measurements, pictures for the stuff to do the investigation later. Like, what were some of the things you gathered? Like the data that you would you would gather. Uh, we would come in, um, take note of what the scene was indoors, outdoors. Was it a traffic accident? Um, general characteristics of your scene. Mm-hmm. Um, also, any uh, you do a, a physical body exam as well once you're there. Um, but first, you would start with pictures of your scene because you can't reconstruct it at later. Right. Um, <clears throat> so you take your photos and then you can do your, your body examination. Um, I would generally do a body exam the same for everybody. So it was easier for me to remember things, um, start at their head, work their work my way down on one side and then back the up, back up the other side and then check out their back. Um, note any injuries or weird discolorations such as like the, the blood settling that'll cause a discoloration, mm-hmm. um, but any wounds, what they're wearing, um, any identifying marks like tattoos, those are important. Um, and then after you're done with the body exam, then you could do more of a scene examination if you needed more information about who that person was or what could have happened. Um, we also talk to the law enforcement on scene and get any statements um, or any statements from um, the people that called in the death. Right. See what they saw. Right. Mm-hmm. So an entire picture around the death of the individual. Correct. Yeah. Hmm. So from your time doing that, you've now transitioned in the last five years to working in the lab. Um, am I getting the story correct? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I transferred from going from working on scene to now I do uh, DNA analysis in the lab. Okay. Again, very fascinating area of science. What are some of the things you do in the lab with DNA analysis? Like for somebody that hears that, the first thing that comes to mind is they're like, oh, it's like they're taking blood from the crime scene. Is it more than that or is that most of it? <laughs> <laughs> it can be blood from a crime scene. Um, it can be a sexual assault kit. 
that we mm -hmm. get from agencies. Um, it can be um, swabbings from guns or bullets as well for like touch DNA. Um, pretty much anything that has biological fluid on it or that we suspect could have biological fluid. So I, I've seen those crime shows lots and you're the first person in forensic science I've really talked to on the podcast. And when, when the crime people, crime scene analysis, people are like, let's send it to the lab. And then they send it and they get the results in like 30 minutes. Is that, that's not accurate, is it? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. So is that something that, that our listeners should know about is that this is not an immediate procedure. It takes time. There's unfortunately there's no Abby, you know, there's not one <laughs> person that does all the things. So um, we have specialized people that do drugs analysis or, you know, document examination or things like that. And then there's also DNA. Hmm. Uh, unfortunately it takes time to get the specimens in or the items in to us. And then, it takes some time to work up, um, like extracting the DNA, uh, analyzing how much there is, and then um, getting a profile from that that item of evidence. Hmm. Um, for a rush case, uh, like a, a public safety sort of case, um, we can get it done in a few days um, to a week max. Hmm. But unfortunately, the, the non-rush cases are the ones that take a lot of time because we have a huge backlog of cases that we're, hmm. we're trying to get through as well. Right. So. It's on the queue kind of. Yes. Unfortunately, hmm. they don't talk about how much paperwork you have to do. <laughs> in <these> shows. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I never see anybody doing any kind of paperwork. Like if I, if I see Dexter, he's like screwing around with string or, you know, like, <laughs> or any of the CSI shows, it's just like they're on a computer and they press click and it's done. Exactly. Um, I, I'd imagine there's more to it than that. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes, there's information the <laughs> and then writing up your reports and yes, <laughs> but I mean, I, who wants to see people doing paperwork for 30 minutes? So <laughs> that's what uh, Hitchcock and Scully for are for on uh, Brooklyn nine, nine. They're the paperwork people. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> how accurate is what you do? Like how, would, what would you say the accuracy is if you get a good sample from a crime scene? Like, let's say uh, Joe Stabby McStabson stabs somebody and in the scuffle, his blood is left at the scene and you get that blood. Um, can you match it to that person with a high degree of accuracy? We can. If there's a if there's a, a really good profile from that blood and then we also okay. have um, the Stabby McStabber, if we have his reference sample. Right. Um, we can do calculations based on how many alleles or, you know, areas in the DNA that we can match. Um, and they can be up to the, a range of a likelihood range of in the like septillions. So oh. um, we look at 21 specific locations. So it's more of a, the probability of him stabbing McStabber being included in this profile is like 16 septillion times more likely than if it was an unknown person. Than uh, yeah. than yeah. Joe McJoseon, who's just walking down the street, mm -hmm. right? So okay. The that, okay. The likelihood that they are included. And what, does everything have DNA? Like, what um, is the best thing to well, get DNA from? Like on a crime scene, like whatever's left behind, what is the best? Like, I'm not, hopefully no criminals are listening and they're like, ooh, I'm taking notes. We can get it notes. from a lot of different um, sources from, from a human <laughs> body, but blood is always good. Uh, sweat is okay. Okay. Um, sometimes we can get it from touch DNA. That's that's a little harder though. Um, but, uh, or swabs from like a sexual assault kit. Those are usually good. But touch DNA, like somebody, they touch the door and then how do you what how do you get the dna off of that then like how, it would be i was just so puzzled like they don't use transparent tape obviously no that it, <laughs> if only um you would moisten a, a swab like a sterile swab with sterile water oh, okay and yeah. then you can um basically rub that over whatever surface um say like your criminal Stabby McStabber was also wearing a hat and he dropped his hat at the scene and he's saying, I was never there, blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, we can actually 
take that swab, the moisten swab, and then rub it on the inside of the cap, like where it touches your forehead. And yep. we can get skin cells or sweat and, and things like that. Um, right. Anything with an epithelial cell is going to have your DNA. So. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like the advice is don't wear a hat if you're going to go stab people. Um, Correct. <laughs> No, the advice is don't stab people. Um, well, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, one more question just along on this is what, what are some other, like, I don't even know what to ask, but like, what are some things that the, the shows get wrong about what you do and your line of work? Like, is there some other things that you watch and you're like, ah, aside from the paperwork and the timeline? Uh, we don't wear Gucci suits when we go out on crime scenes. <laughs> you don't? No, unfortunately. Um, neither do, or nor do we wear uh, high heels or drive Hummers. So, <laughs> yeah. but, you probably wear comfortable, seas- uh, reasonable shoes, I'd imagine. Yes. Also, something that's easily cleaned. Um, oh, yeah. But I think that, and then some of the technology they have in their labs are are. Pr- pretty that would be pretty awesome if they really existed so like when they they show the pictures of the inside of the person and this is where the stab wound went and this is the knife that they used yeah. unfortunately we don't have and then it way. zooms in on the blade and you're like see the serrated edge here it matches exactly to the right whatever or is that real i don't know like i just i'm not in your line of work like sometimes i'm like is that true i don't know you can determine how how far in it went and how on a, on a good stab wound, well, good looking, sorry. Um, you can actually tell which way the blade was going. If you push the skin together, you can see Mm. where the blade was, how wide it was. Um, but we don't have anything that does that 3d, uh, rendering like they do in the shows. Right. So like in, uh, the dark Knight, the Batman movie, he was like shooting bullets at a wall and then reconstructed the bullet back to the original bullet to use. Like, is that, that's, is that far fetched? That seems like that's crazy. That's bananas. I haven't seen that movie. So. Okay. Maybe it's not in that movie, but I swear there's some, like they're trying to match what bullet to what shot by shooting bullets at a wall. And then the computer reconstructed the exploded bullet back to the real bullet. Hmm. Seems like that's science fiction. We can actually do trajectory though. Um, oh, okay. Sort of like when Dexter's doing the string thing with the blood. Right. You can do something similar with trajectory rods um, and shootings. And oh. that will show like where, where they were standing or the general area of where they were standing when they were shooting. It obviously has to be fairly close, right? Or do you have like really long rods for people that get shot from really far away? Um, there are some really long rods, like when they're doing uh car examinations um okay but that's sort of out of my my purview i've seen them do it and they do use really long rods for those but wow okay that's pretty cool (laughs) uh leela i could ask you a hundred thousand more questions i've got this giant (laughs) list of like follow-up questions but uh let's i i do have one more uh question that we discussed kind of before you were on on the podcast right now and and that's just uh, a fascination that people have with um, death, but also the study of death. And one of those areas are, and my mind might, might be using the term wrong, they're body farms. Yeah, that's um, the term. That's the term? Mm-hmm. Could, could you talk to us a little bit about, about that? Sure. Because I, I would imagine what they find on that does come to you in the lab as reference. Um, well, it, do- it doesn't really come to us in the lab, but we use oh. their research. Right. That's what I meant. They use oh. their research. I I didn't mean to, yeah, I didn't mean to paraphrase that you get the data from the body farm, but you get their conclusions kind yes. of thing to use yeah. later. Okay. All right. So uh, <laughs> could, could you, could you talk to us about that? Sure. Uh, the main uh, body farm that a lot of people think about is in Tennessee and it's part of the anthropology research that they have there. Um, I think it's at the university of Tennessee. So what they do there is they have an anthropology or basically that's the, the study of bones, post-mortem bones um, Mm -hmm. and any uh, injuries or um, uh, 
any changes that occurs to the bones after death. So they have an anthropology research center there where people donate their bodies to this service and they're placed outside or in any sort of position that they'd like to study. Um, and they are, they decompose out there. And then the, mm -hmm. the students at the research facility um, take measurements or observations about what happens uh, in those situations. Um, they also have a skeletal collection there that they, that they work on um, to study modern human skeletal variations and pathology. Also trauma, like what does, what does post-mortem or pre-mortem trauma look like on bones? They can help determine that. Um, and then also they assist, the forensic anthropology people would assist with um, identification of a subject. Is it male or female? How tall they could be? And things like that. But mainly the body farms are, are helpful for the, the research that they provide in what happens when someone dies. Like how do they decompose and what situations could change that decomposition pattern? Hmm. Yeah, because without without that, you'd be reliant on some. Yeah, I'm just saying, some grisly gumshoe that's seen everything and is the only person that knows in your department, right? Right. Because um, unfortunately, decomposition doesn't always, or death death investigation, like coming up with time of death, is is not always set in stone you know the location of the person um, any medical history uh, the temperature or the environment of where they passed away can all influence their decomposition yeah, one more question so i i feel like just from you saying that that when i watch a tv show and they're like this person died at 1205 a.m that's kind of too specific yes Unless it was <laughs> witnessed, we don't. Right. Okay. And then they say, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can come up with a general, you know, maybe if they passed away recently, we can say within a certain number of hours or, um, you know, a certain number of days. But unfortunately, we're not as specific as they say on TV. Because mm -hmm. XYZ starts to happen when the brain stops and the heart stops beating or the Correct. brain there's yeah. Yeah. You've got the, you know, your oxygen is depleted and excess carbon dioxide starts to build up within you. And then your, your cells start to rupture things like that. And the bacteria in your gut start to do what they do best and digest things and, you know, gas builds up. Um, also your, your body stiffens in a, in a specific way, which is nice. That helps us determine time of death. Um, That's, are you speaking of rigor mortis? Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, so it, it starts in your, in your face, like in your jaw, and then it works its way down into your torso and then out through your extremities and it sticks around for a little while and then it'll actually go away. So we can tell if maybe somebody's possibly been moved, like their rigor mortis isn't consistent with their positioning oh. or what they think the time of death is. Um, there's also liver mortis, which is the settling of your blood. So that also helps determine, you know, a time frame for the death. Or if that person's been moved, does does the <clears throat> the position or the the pattern of that liver mortis does it match with what the position they were found in? So. Can you can you explain like Lib liber mortis Library. i don't know is that okay <laughs> yes. oh, man i i'm so sorry i have so many questions this is this is a fascinating um liber mortis is when your blood stops circulating and then okay. it starts to settle due to gravity so if i were if i passed away while i was laying on my back on the floor um you would expect to see the blood pooling on my back and then wherever it was like pushing against something, there wouldn't be any um, liver mortis. Uh, so you'd actually get a pattern of like if I passed away laying on a like a like a deck chair that has slats, you would see that pattern of slats on my back. But if I were to pass away, say, on that deck chair, the liver mortis starts in and then somebody moved me hours or more later um, or a half a day, whatever, 
and that pattern wasn't consistent with the way I was then found later, then it would indicate that somebody that I had been moved after death. Oh, I see. Like got moved to a beach or to the ground somewhere. It'd be inconsistent with the ground, basically. Oh. (laughs) And just back to the body farms with the bones that they have, um, from the skeletal remains, is it pretty accurate? Can they determine if they have enough bones, if it was a male or female? Like, is that something that is true? Yeah. I have, I ha- yeah, okay, so that's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, so but if they have, oh. sorry, go ahead, yeah. It's especially good for determining the, the sex of the individual is is the pelvic, the pelvic bones. Right, okay. So you'll definitely have a, a wider opening if it's a female for the babies and a narrower um pelvic floor for males so. but if you have like a like a thumb bone that's not enough that's right not enough. No. okay so you need more of okay all right okay so i'm just i'm just trying to check my ignorance here with the expert in the room and There's that's you <laughs> to go on so like your femoral bones could help indicate how tall you were but mm-hmm. they put a whole bunch of bones together to make their their conclusions right just like anything in science. Correct. I don't know if you can answer this. I've just got one more question before we kind of wrap up this section. Um, is there something that you find interesting about um, death and investigating death and, and crime scenes and things like that? Like the interesting can be even like uh, darkly interesting. <laughs> um, I always liked the anatomy portion of it. Um, I always found it fascinating. Um, so we do, we do have a background in, in medical, um, whether it's you know, the anatomy and physiology of a person or also how their medical histories could tie into their, their cause of death. Um, mm-hmm. But I always liked the, the anatomy, especially like if they were in a car accident or some sort of thing. This is going to sound kind of morbid, but when they're in a bad car accident and something happens to them and you can see their internal organs or things like that. It's fascinating to, for me to see the anatomy of a person. Like outside their body from some terrific, horrific crash or something like that. Like something that shouldn't be there that you know, oh, that's the thing. Yes. Um, or oh, okay. like a gunshot wound to the head and you get to see their brain. Oof. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just anatomically interesting. <laughs> so. Somebody, somebody had a good quote. I forget. I don't know who to attribute it to that. Um, like the human body is just a bunch of meat <laughs> in a tiny little bit of skin that keeps us from like all of our stuff spilling out everywhere. So yes, because that's what you deal with. Like you see what happens when the little bit of thing that keeps our, our insides and our insides, uh, and they're you not see that there. lots. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, but my favorite part was always tracking down or figuring out who this person was and tracking down their family members to let them know what happened. And then mm-hmm. also helping them through the process of what happens next. So, cause you know, not everybody, yeah, not everybody deals with taxes and things like that. And we know the process, but not everybody knows the process of like what happens after someone dies. So that was always mm. really rewarding to help families through those processes. Right. And they'd be, that would be just one little bit of stress off of their back, right? Like, oh, okay, this is what I do now. Like you give them a list of things or, or you solve that problem. Yeah. I can see why that would be so important. Yeah. Hmm. Especially if they're grieving, you're not thinking straight too. You need help there too. Exactly. Hmm. So it's, it's always good to, to help them through the process. So that's what hmm. I always found rewarding. Layla, thanks for talking to us about your job. It's absolutely fascinating and critical to, to helping law enforcement and and I guess like even closure for, for families after a death. So exactly. uh, just wow. <laughs> We're going to have to move on. I'm going to have to leave all of my uh, questions for another day. Ooh, hard right. Uh, this The next section of the podcast is is uh, where we ask the guests a little bit more about themselves personally outside of their area of study. And uh, the first one is for a pet story. Um, I know this is a a hard right (laughs) from what we were talking about, but uh, uh, do you have a pet story you could share with us? Yes. 
um, right now, well, I've always been uh, a cat lover. I've always had cats. So right now we have one giant cat. Uh, his name's Frodo. And he's he's more of a, <laughs> he's more of a cadog. Um, oh, okay. He likes to fetch <laughs> and he likes belly rubs. Ah. And then let's see, I wrote down how much he weighs. Because <laughs> is he weighs, big or small? He's big. He's twenty six pounds. So he's whoa. Like, oh, <laughs> it for the rest of the world uh 11.79 kilograms <laughs> he might be the actual weight of a hobbit i think so he's got the big <laughs> so and uh so he's he's such a good boy and we can clean his ears and do all the things and um he started to get these lumps on his chest which oh. ended up to be um just like f- little fat tumors but they were in an, an uncomfortable position for him so we we had them removed and we determined that there was no way he was going to wear the cone of shame. <laughs> I was like, well, what else are we going to do? And we <laughs> come to find out we had some extra, um, some extra underwear laying around. And yeah. he actually, we cut a hole in it and then he wore the underwear like a little t-shirt <laughs> and it was perfect. <laughs> it, you know, he didn't play with the stitches or anything like that. And he wore those things like he was a model on a runway and he uh, loved wearing them and he didn't take them off. And so it was, he's such a good boy. So. That's like Beaker's surge suit when we, we got yeah. her spade. She had the little cute little outfit that we put on her instead of the cone. And it was great. It's so much easier. <laughs> yeah. Except uh, you got to remember to take it off when she pees. Yeah, um, this, I don't the, know how that works with cats, uh, but with Beaker, it kind of like, it was like a baby onesie, right? So we had to always undo the back when we took her out and we forgot. We're like, oh, well, that's yeah. a problem. <laughs> this is more of a t-shirt. So we didn't have to worry about that part. So <laughs> oh, Okay. Good deal. So, yes. Adorable. Did you take any pictures of Frodo oh, yeah. in the un- underwear shirt? Oh, okay. <laughs> If you have some, you should, could you send them to me uh, to use when we, when your episode comes out? Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, now for the next question, uh, if your mind has an already not been blown, I don't know what else we can do for you, but the next question is the super fact. Mm-hmm. We always ask our guests to share something with us that blows people away a bit. Um, do you have a super fact you could share with us, Lila? Sure. Um, one of my, my super fact is actually about, uh, the, the DNA investigation or, okay. So yeah. it's always been fascinating to me that the human genome or, you know, our, our chromosomes, you know, the 46 that we have half from mom and dad, um, they're about 3.1 billion base pairs inside your, that genome. It's huge. So in those, that three, that 3.1 billion base pairs, the the DNA that's similar between say you and me or me and my husband is over 99% the same. And that's what makes us human, you know, two arms, two legs, um, just basically human. And it's that in forensics, it's that less than 1% that we're actually interested in. So it's just always been fascinating to me that our DNA is so similar um, to each other. Wow. Okay. That is mind blowing. I'm just trying to, (laughs) I'm just trying to think of that. Yeah. That's wild. I love it. It's the, that tiny, tiny, tiny portion that, that we're interested in forensics to be able to separate out the differences between people. Right. Between Stabby McStabson and normal walking Joe. Exactly. Yes. Cause Hmm. we don't want to put the wrong person in prison. (laughs) This is, yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, that is a super fact. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the last question is where we ask our guests to share something that they're passionate about in the important to you section. Um, you want to talk about motorcycle riding and somehow that relates to dogs. I'm really curious. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> um, well, I've been, I've been with my husband for um, going on 13 years now. And okay. one of our first states was motorcycle ride together. So we would, we traveled all over the place riding on motorcycles. And one of the first things we did was actually go on a, it's called ride for guide dogs. And there's a, a group. Um, it's a, a guide dog school in Southern, okay, California, yeah. in Southern California. 
And every year they offer a, a ride for guide dogs where everybody meets on their motorcycles at the school. And then there's a, um, they give you a map and then you can go to different places, usually in the Los Angeles mountain area. And at each stop that you go to, they have um, puppy raisers and you get to pet all the puppies and you make multiple stops on your ride. And then you come back to the, the school and you get to pet all the puppies and talk to the puppy raisers and raise money for the, the school for the, the guide dogs. So Aww. we've been doing that every year. Um, and then unfortunately coronavirus hit and they haven't mm. been able to do it. So, yeah, but and I've been looking forward to it because I finally got my own motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> years ago. So I really want to go. But so the last thing we did um, was we actually drove a road from Southern California to Sturgis, South Dakota. For the right. Road. Okay. Yeah. I know. I know where Sturgis is. Yep. Yes. So that was a good ride. It was, it was a long ride, but it was a good ride. That is days long, isn't it? Like you're not doing that in one day. <laughs> no, it, it, it took two days of hard riding to get there. Um, it's about, uh, for you guys, it's about 2000 kilometers. Yeah. For us, so yeah, we did it in two days to get there and then three days to get back. Oof, that's a thousand kilometers a day. That's, that's some driving. That, yes. It was a lot, <laughs> but it was well worth it. The the scenery was amazing. Yeah, you'd get to see the like the scenery from California. Did you go through the middle of the states? Because oh. the Dakotas are like top, right? Like uh, top middle. Where are they in the United States? Yeah, I think top so. Middle. Yep. Yeah. So we went through um, California to through Las Vegas, and then up through Utah, Wyoming. Oh, beautiful, South Dakota. Yeah, that would have been super cool. It was yeah. nice. So, but you can relate the motorcycles to the ride for guide dogs. And yeah, so that's always a fun time to go do that one. Sweet. Now I have to ask you one more question, Layla. Mm -hmm. uh, you can play the bagpipes. Is this correct? Yes, yes I can. Okay. <laughs> How does one lear learn to play the bagpipes? How does one want to play the bagpipes? Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I get that. You must be English. <laughs> Um, I'm part Scottish and I went to school in Scotland. So that's, yeah. I just love the sound of them. Um, oh, no, I love them too. I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> I do. They're haunting. And in like an appropriate, like obviously if I just started to bust it out in the middle of my classroom when I'm teaching, I might annoy some people. It's a little awkward. Um, yeah, but there's like, there's places that they sound absolutely amazing in. Um, before... Our students graduate, for example, at the the grad, they are piped, they're piped out. Hey. The yeah, they're the bagpipes pipe yep. pipe the kids out. I'm um, on the sheriff's honor guard and I, I pipe at the graduations. So Oh sweet. Mm -hmm. So it's good. do you know why that is? Like I it's very cool and it it is it like uh what's the reason why they do that at grads? Do you know? Um uh, well I think for mainly also well mostly for like the police and fire. Um, I know there's a huge tradition and a tie back to Ireland and Scotland. So that's mm. why we have the bagpipes for that. Um, not so sure. It's probably just kind of maybe just slid in think every it's, other graduation. Cause it's, it's yeah, it's like weird. cultural or something. Yeah. Yes. Huh. I'm going to ask about that because I'm not complaining. I'm just curious as to what started it. You know, it only takes it happening one time and then repeated for it to become a tradition. So that's potentially okay. 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 When you play the bagpipes, do you know multiple songs or is it their conspiracy? I've heard that it's all the same song. <laughs> All the time. No, we do know. We do, <laughs> I do know multiple songs, but I can see okay. people think that. Um, unfortunately, the bagpipes only have nine notes. So it depends on what kind of uh, accents or other grace notes or things like that to help a song sound different from another one. But, mm. but we do have different songs. <laughs> okay. I'm just, te I'm just teasing. <laughs> I, I can see how people think that. <laughs> <laughs> Lila, we're at the end of our chat today. Uh, I, again, I have so many follow-up questions. 
we might have to have you back in a, a year or something to to do like round two of forensic science. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. We're we're working on some different uh, some different um, techniques and stuff in our in our crime lab as well. So oh sweet, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's cool. Can people follow you on social media? Like, do you have a social media people page or a website or anything like that? Um, I'm on Twitter, Piper Leela, but <laughs> I don't really post a lot. I use Twitter mainly for mental health dog following reasons. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's that's a good way to use social media. Mm-hmm. So it's it's mainly about following the dogs and things like that. Sometimes I post, but. Not very often. It's certainly not about gotcha. work related things. But. <laughs> well, I mean, your yours is such that it's uh, not super appropriate, I would think. Not really. <laughs> um, thank you so much for chatting with us today on the Science Podcast. Um, My pleasure. Again, like it's, I I hope people weren't turned off by the you know it's a dark subject if you want to think of it that way, but it's it's part of life, it's part of society, and it's an important job that you do. So, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, it's time for story time with me. Um, if you don't know what story time is, story time is when we talk about stories that have happened within the past one or two weeks. I will start. So if you don't know, I like to play a game with Beaker where we throw around a toy and I throw it really far away and she goes and runs to go get it. And she really likes playing this game because she's a retriever. That's what she was bred to do. Um, and I throw it really far. It goes all the way across the house. Um, and then she goes grab it. She grabs it and runs back, and then she she doesn't necessarily give it back to me. I take it from her, and she gives it willingly. I take it back from her, and she uh, she kind of lets go of it because she knows how the game works now. Um, but yeah, I will be I will throw it back and forth, back and forth, back and forth a few times, and then eventually she'll uh, be done with me and run past me and chew the toy after uh, after she's done with me, but. Today, what we did, de- oh, not today, but like uh, a couple days ago, what we decided to do was Mum and I would throw the toy back and forth and back and forth, and we'd play keep away with the dogs, uh, with the dog, with Beaker. Um, and she would run to me, and she'd run to Mum, and then she'd run to me, and then we would drop it so then she would get a fair chance at getting the toy and still be happy. And she was pretty happy. She was smiling and running around. She was very happy. Um, and then Bunsen, he, Bunsen joined in the game. And he doesn't really know how to play games. He knows how to catch food in his mouth. I taught him how to do that, but he doesn't know how to play games too well. So he got hit by the toy a couple times because he didn't know that, that he had to like not get hit by the toy to have fun. But eventually Beaker was done with our shenanigans and she actually ran the opposite way that we were going and she went into my parents' bedroom and just started eating the toy. Yeah, so that's what happened. And then afterwards Bunsen got really rowdy and he doesn't know how to play so he started fighting with Beaker. Um, yeah, so that's what happened. Mom, do you have a story? I sure do. My story actually happened today. It was a busy day. It's a busy day in our household, and there was a lot going on. But one thing that was going on was Jason had to put in some extra time at school today. He had a bunch of marking to do, and he has a workout uh, at 5.30. So he said, I'm just going to stay at the school and get my stuff done. And I said, that's perfect. And part of my gift to him is that I would take the dogs for a walk. And I did this um, out of the goodness of my heart, not because he asked, because I love the dogs and they need a, they need a good walk. Anyway, so we walked up and down the driveway, um, and our driveway is quite long. Uh, if you've seen from the drone footage, there's uh, a long way on the driveway. And so we walked up and down, up and down, up and down, and then uh, Ellie came over, and Beaker was so happy to see Ellie. She was like, I am so glad, I am vibrating, I am so happy. Um, And if you don't know who Ellie is, she is my great niece. She is sister to Raffi. And um, she would have been staying uh, at the farm. She got picked up today. Anyway, so what happened was I said, would you like to come for a walk with us? And she's like, oh, yes. And so she got her mitts and she got her toque and um, Beaker took her mitt. 
because she dropped it and she's like, ah, Beaker, but Beaker didn't really take it. Uh, it was just super cute. And then we, I said, let's go for a walk. And so we walked up and down and we got to talk about her day and, uh, the dogs were really well behaved until Bunsen decided he was going to be rowdy. So this is his new personality. It's the let's be rowdy with Beaker personality. Um, while I'm trying to watch Ellie as she's doing face plants because she, um, is very klutzy because she was falling off the snow banks that we had plowed from our skid steer. So it was quite energetic and quite fun uh, this afternoon for a short while while we were walking the dogs, and uh, everybody had a great time. And that's my story. All right, Dad, do you have a story? Sure, I'll talk about a non-dog story. I'll talk about a family story. We were invited as cosplay guests to be the entertainment at a hockey game. Um, It's the WHL team, so it's one one level below NHL. Hockey's a big deal in Canada. Um, they're called the Edmonton Oil Kings, and it was superhero night. And we were lucky enough to be asked by the Edmonton Cosplay Group to come up with our costumes and have some fun with the kids. And uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And uh, things are starting to open back up in Alberta. So crowd, there was a big crowd, and uh, it was really, really cute to see all the kids see all of their different heroes that they love. Um, I had my big giant Groot suit. Chris was Rocket. Adam was Loki. And then Duncan, uh, our oldest son, he was Star-Lord. And uh, the kids love the Guardians of the Cal- Galaxy. They they know who Rocket is. They know who Star-Lord is. They know who Groot is. Um, and they, they also have other favorites, too, that other cosplayers there. There was a lot of Spider-Mans. Was the Spider-Man was popular. Uh, my story is more about Adam um, because Adam got to be a different character this time normally he's rocket uh and he wanted to be loki he wanted to be a different character because he's been rocket for like five years four years he's been rocket for like three or four years um so we we got a loki costume i made the the weapons and the big helmet and he had so much fun being the loki to everybody who was walking around him he was uh he, he got paired up with a scarlet witch cosplayer she's from the marvel TV shows like the, the superhero shows and Adam was having a lot of fun by like when kids would come up for a picture because um, that's what people do here. We were taking like hundreds of pictures. Um, so people wanted pictures with Loki and Scarlet Witch. He'd hand them one of the daggers that I 3D printed and <laughs> he's the, he'd be like, hey, hello, children. He does a really good Loki accent, Tom Hiddleston accent. Um, and he's like, here, kid, do you want this dagger? And then Scarlet Witch would be the Scarlet Witch cosplayer would be like Loki. You can't give a kid a dagger. And then Adam, I remember overhearing him say, would like, when I was three years old on Asgard, I got my first dagger. Like, you know, in the, I can't do the Loki accent. So not dog related, but it was really, really fun to see Adam embracing Loki. And also our older son, Duncan, um, he loves being Star-Lord because he hams it up with everybody and he dances around. So that's my story for this week in the family section. That's it for another Science Podcast episode. Thanks for coming back week after week to listen to our show. Special thanks to our expert guest, Leela Periello, who talked to us about being a criminalist and our time at being a coroner. We'd also like to give a special shout out to our top tier patrons on Patreon. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Take it away, Chris. Chris Kelly. Samantha Dodd, Kimberly Bond, Nate Stephenson, Debbie Anderson, Courtney Proven, Renee Hardy, Mary Rater, Shelby Leggett, Mary Coos, Katya Lynch, Marianne McNally, Andrea Persons, Elizabeth Bourgeois, Karen Beth St. George, Bianca Hyde, Sandy Brimer, Tracy Halberg, Jenny Jaguer, Leela Periello, Lynn Armstrong, Lisa Sports, Catherine Jordan, Donna Craig, Lila Ashir, Jody Ogren, Liz Button, Kathy Zerker, and Ben Rathert. For science, empathy, and cuteness. Uh, <laughs>